Once again, Russia is sounding the alarm to civilians living in the occupied region of Kherson. Ukrainian forces are advancing on the southern front to retake the territory. The Kremlin has been pushing civilians to leave the parts of Kherson it controls, evacuating them to Russia or other occupied areas. But removing civilians from their homes to enemy-held land is, in fact, a war crime. Damatila Sagamaso is a senior lecturer at the Department of War Studies at King's College London, and she joins me now. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I want to start by asking what you think is behind the pro-Russian authorities' decision to remove residents from Kherson. Are they preparing for a military withdrawal, or are Russian forces positioning themselves, essentially, uh, to resist the Ukrainian advance? I think that it looks very much like a retreat. Uh, they are trying to save uh, the forces that are uh, based in Kherson, which were stuck between uh, the advancing Ukrainian army and the rivers. They couldn't cross the, the Dnieper River. So they are probably thinking that it makes more sense to save some of the valuable troops, the more professional forces that were deployed in that area, further to the south and the southeast. Uh, to protect these forces. Uh, but there is, of course, a big question mark as to whether Russia intended to sort of um, uh, ex make some explosions in the dam uh, in, uh, in Nova Kachovka and in some way sort of uh, flood the region. Mm. And if that was the intention, it also made sense to ask for civilians to leave and for the military to leave. So I think that we cannot exclude that these two elements come hand in hand, that there was a plan which was in a way uncovered by uh, Western intelligence and Ukrainian intelligence uh, of sort of, you know, uh, in some way uh, making explosion, exploding or attacking or in some way blowing up the, the dam. Right. And that would have created a major catastrophe. And that's why maybe that was the reason why they were asking also people, civilians to leave. Tell us, what do you believe is the real intention of Russia's targeting of civilian infrastructure? And can that plan of action succeed? Well, Russia has, a, has a three, I mean, three, in my view, three objectives in mind when it's trying to hit at, at uh, this uh, sort of infrastructure, which is very important for the subsistence of the Ukrainian economy and, and lives of individuals. So it is trying to really denigrate the ability of Ukraine to function as an effective state, in, to turn it into a sort of completely dysfunctional uh, economy where people cannot go about their daily lives. Uh, the intention in that respect is then so that the, the, the people and the government feels under pressure to mm. enter into some kind of negotiations with Russia. And of course, also to debilitate the military ability of Ukrainians to advance, because if you break up uh, many of the infrastructure uh, sort of um, core nodes, it makes it harder for the Ukrainians to uh, carry out their operation, to have the right logistic support, to move their forces. So I think it has a, a series of objectives to really stop the Ukrainian advance militarily, but also to sort of denigrate the ability of Ukraine to function as an effective state. And, and again, within this context, in the theater that we're now seeing it being uh, employed, can it be successful in all likelihood? Well, I mean, we have to see. We have to see how strong is the Ukrainian resilience, uh, to what extent, and this is a very important point, you know, Western countries such as Germany and also the United States can provide with uh, air defense systems uh, on time to sort of stop uh, these um, these incoming missiles. I think that technology is there and the, the weaponry, once it arrives, it can function effectively. But the problem is that a lot of this air defense system has not been fully delivered yet. Mm. So uh, when the equipment is in place, I think Ukrainians can be in a very strong position, much better than they are now, to, to address these incoming uh, sort of attacks. Uh, I think that uh, if this is not occurring, you know, the pressures on the Ukrainian government might increase. But we have seen that Ukrainians have very strong resilience. And I think that they have uh, really uh, understood that what are the challenges of allowing Russia to occupy some of these territories right. because of the atrocities that are occurring. So I think that they know that they don't really have much of a choice. Uh, a lot will depend on our ability also to help Ukrainians. Uh, that's why I think it is very important to provide them now with the necessary air defense systems. It's sort of imperative now. We'll have to end it there. That is uh, Domitila Sagramaso. Many, many thanks for your time. And most importantly, your perspective. Thank you. 
Elsewhere across Ukraine, Russia's attacks on infrastructure have caused blackouts and water shortages. Authorities say millions are without power and are asking those who still have it to conserve as much as they can. Aid workers in Mykolaiv prepare food for the city's hungry. Power and gas outages have left many unable to cook. These meals are going to feed new mothers in the darkened hallways of Mykolaiv's maternity hospital number three. It's our first day without electricity. We can't cook, but we need to feed the maternity ward, the mothers with newborns. The donated lunches help a lot. They're saving us. Engineers are racing to repair the damage before winter. Officials in Kyiv say it could be days or even weeks before power and heat are restored in the capital. In the unlit city, some businesses refuse to let circumstances shut them down. This restaurant is staying open by candlelight, an adjustment that diners are trying to embrace as a sign of resilience. As a matter of fact, it toughens us up even more. There's been a power cut, but it helps our Ukraine. We save power, and apart from that, you can feel the mood. It's very romantic. On the front lines, far from thoughts of romantic dinners, Ukraine's defenders are trying to remain upbeat, despite the constant shelling from Russian lines. Commander Yuri compares the destruction to a famous siege from World War II. Like Stalingrad, because we have maybe 90% of buildings are demolished. Yeah, yeah. Like, like Stalingrad. Stalingrad, we, have, we call them Stalingrad. <laughs> but it's a Solidar. <laughs> a few minutes down the road from Solidar is the city of Bakhmut, which Moscow has been trying to capture for months. Analysts say it has no strategic value, but the Ukrainian defenders say the enemy keeps sending troops in droves. Our guys were fighting with them. Their bodies were just lying there, 50, 100 per day. They didn't even take the bodies away. Our guys went to have a look and took their guns. I can give you a gun if you want. Like the civilians whose lives and homes they are defending, Ukraine's frontline soldiers are hanging on, but at a devastating cost. <laughs>